Hi everyone, a very happy Tuesday and welcome back to our Arm Tech Talk series. This is the place for the latest and greatest in trends, technologies and best practices from Arm and our ecosystem partners. And it's great you could join us today, wherever you're joining us from, if it's your morning, afternoon or evening. We've got an awesome tech talk lined up for you today from Brainchip. Uh, talking about their uh, Kida platform and how it works together with Arm. Really excited to have them today and super excited to hear all your questions you're going to have for them, no doubt. Uh, if you're this is the first time to one of these tech talks, then particular uh, welcome to you. We hold these weekly at four o'clock UK, 8 a.m. Pacific, for all the latest uh, from Arm and our ecosystem partners. Uh, and this is the place to come. So if you want to head to the next slide, Nanan, we can just tell the... Uh, the audience how to get involved if you've joined one of these talks before you know the drill with this i uh, just wanted to tell you how you can get involved in today's conversation you can of course tweet us uh, using the hashtag arm tech talks or indeed post on linkedin and please use that hashtag uh, we have done 60 plus of these talks over the last few years and they're all available on demand in fact today's talk is also being live streamed on youtube so the recording will be available straight after today's session so if at any point your internet dies uh, you know, cat walks over the keyboard and uh, and disables your internet connection or signs you off of the uh, signs you off of the webinar. Then you can absolutely catch anything you missed on demand at YouTube.com/arm and make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss any of these uh, talks that we do on a on a weekly basis and all the other great content that Arm produces. Uh, and we've got a bunch of talks coming up. You can sign up for those at Arm.com/techtalks. And the schedule's here. We're just about to release a whole bunch more, so this list will become enormous in the next week or so. Uh, if you don't want to miss any of those, then again, make sure you're uh, subscribed to our mailing list or indeed just head to arm.com slash tech talk straight after this talk so you can secure one of the limited spaces we have on this platform uh, and uh, ask the audience, uh, ask our panelists the questions. So let's talk about today. Today we are joined by Nandan from Brainchip, uh, Chief Marketing Officer at Brainchip. He's just going to get his camera and mic set up in just a second. Uh, and we're going to be talking about their fantastic offering that works together with Arm. Um, in terms of asking questions, please get your questions in the Q&A box on Zoom. Uh, that's in the menu bar at the bottom, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the platform at all. Uh, and just get those in as they come through. And I'll ask Nandan and the team from Brainchip those questions at the end. Uh, so, Nandan, it's great you could join us today. Thanks so much for uh, getting today's presentation together with the team. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to you for you to take it away and tell us all about how Brainship works together with Arm and how you can go cloudless uh, on Arm together with Brainship. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tobias. Um, it's great to be back. Um, I might just slide back one to say, hey, you can read all about who I am, but really the important thing is right now we're running um, marketing, that's CMO and product for Brainship. I have a long history with Arm. Um, as do some of my uh, colleagues here who will uh, join us at the latter half of uh, our webinar, okay? Just to kind of uh, uh, introduce Brainchip for those who haven't yet uh, come across it. Uh, Brainchip is the first company to commercialize a neuromorphic IP platform. Uh, and in fact, our reference chip uh, came out over two years ago. We focus right from the beginning on edge AI solutions rather than uh, technology that would be scaling all the way to cloud. You have to make choices that are different uh, to make edge AI efficient and performant. Uh, our focus has been on neuromorphic or event-based um, processing, which is really the, the focus on how you get really a compelling processing at the most efficient level. It tries to mimic the way neurons work in the brain, and the brain, as you know, is probably the most efficient uh, intelligent computer on the planet. Um, that was driven by about 15 years of research, uh, and we have uh, a pretty wide variety of uh, locations where obviously we get uh, the talent that's best uh, fit for our purposes. So we have our main offices in the US, our research and science office in Australia, we've got uh, software in France uh, and development uh, in India as well. It's good to kind of also understand that uh, Brainchip's been around for a bit and actually has shown quite a bit of uh, traction in the market. Uh, you, you can see the companies that have been working with us, Megachips and Renesis have been uh, IP licensees. 
Uh, there are other companies like Valeo, Mercedes-Benz that have demonstrated range of technology on their concepts. Um, and then of course, um, we have a broad ecosystem, including uh, partners like Arm who are critical to our success and critical to our building out uh, a true edge AI um, processing ecosystem. You can see the logos out there. Uh, it's growing quite uh, quite regularly. So that's a bit of a, a quick intro, shall we say, to Brainchip as a company. So with that, um, we can transfer to the, the problem of Deger. So if you look at the four big numbers, and the numbers keep getting bigger to the right, um, the cost of training has become a very, very critical issue for scaling of AI. I mean, we talked about $6 million to train a model. If you start getting into the generative, generative AI models, it's actually substantially bigger, right? So you can't afford to constantly train the model, even for things like drift, uh, because it becomes expensive. And the more the bigger the model the, uh, that you're doing on the cloud, the more expensive it gets. At the same time, the problems are mounting and you can actually help solve these problems by doing better intelligent solutions closer to uh, the actual devices themselves. And that is at the edge. The assumption are, is that you, you have to connect to cloud, but really you don't get the real time uh, uh, responses. You don't get the real time capabilities unless you move closer to the edge. So the second number talks about roughly the uh, annual losses estimated by Deloitte on um, manufacturing downtime due to unplanned um, uh, issues, right? So the line going down due to a, a, a predictable breakage, for example, which you could have done earlier. So that's about $50 billion, and that's purely in manufacturing. But as we get to the, uh, the real problems, you can do more AI, but you also have a, a bigger problem to deal with, which is the amount of data that you're processing. How can you solve that? A, an, an, a connected car, for example, uh, generates about one terabyte of data per day. When you multiply by the number of cars, you're, you can see the, the problem expanding. And the final number, which really uh, rocked me, was uh, the fact that the estimate is about $1.1 trillion lost due to preventable um, issues. So this is not the solving of the problem. This is just the productivity lost due to people not showing up for work due to preventable um, health issues and chronic health issues. So the problems are pretty um, uh, big and growing. And AI certainly has solutions for them. But it needs to scale to support that. So if you look at it, the opportunity is pretty large, right? So you, you are likely to have over 1 trillion plus uh, edge devices. The expectation by PricewaterhouseCoopers is that by 2030, annually, the GDP impact due to AI will be nearly $16, billion, $16 trillion. So that's a pretty big um, impact out of which we expect about over 1.2 trillion, and that's actually a conservative number. Uh, numbers are much higher than that. That would be the AIoT market. I mean, obviously this is devices, software, services, so on and so forth. So the opportunity is pretty large. The question is, uh, what are the challenges in solving it, right? So we talked about cost of cloud services. I think we're preaching to the choir here. Everybody understands that those can't scale at the level needed. Uh, to make AI ubiquitous. Naturally, even with the best efforts of 5G, responsiveness is a problem whenever you're connected to the cloud because you can't guarantee signal. You can't guarantee you are going to be in a high coverage location. And even if you were, the level of compute that needs to be done and the communication needs to be done is not going to be sufficient. The third part is scalability and efficiency, right? If, if you're going to cloud a more generic uh, top level model, you may not get the benefits of scale, benefits of context that you do when you're closer to the device. Also, you are going to have to up, upscale the device itself and hence there are cost impacts to it as well. And finally, privacy and protection. Every um, individual seems to be getting more and more sensitive 
to their behaviors or their habits being actually constantly monitored. As devices get even closer to you, uh, you tend to get even more worried about that. Same thing happens when we're talking about industrial situations or corporate situations where uh, behavioral activities, uh, fundamental process activities tend to get um, pretty critical for your own success. Okay. So what are we doing about that? The, the way to go about it would be to reduce cloud inference cost by moving uh, a lot of that inference closer to the edge. Minimize the uh, cloud retraining or new model, uh, updated model development, which is a, a pretty sizable cost. In order to improve responsiveness, obviously you need compelling levels of compute at the edge, right, for uh, real-time compute. Uh, and at the same time, you need them to be efficient enough to be able to run in um, fanless environments. Leads us to the third part, which is the efficiency that you need to actually run in those thermal environments. That's the real point of scale. And if you get to that level, then obviously packaging costs um, uh, and other you know, box costs, et cetera, go down. And hence, you effectively make it more cost effective to scale multiple devices. And finally, you want to reduce the exposure to sensitive data. Sending raw data to cloud is fraught with challenges, both privacy and security. Um, also, more raw data going out explodes the system as well. So you want to minimize the amount of data going because from a systemic level, you want to reduce um, uh, communication costs, system costs, storage costs. So these are pretty straightforward, simple views of how you want to do distributed AI and certainly move to the edge so you can be untethered from the cloud. So what does BrainChip do, right? So BrainChip has focused on neuromorphic uh, compute. Akita is our first um, uh, product offering, and we actually talk about the second generation of that. And the focus with neuromorphic is that it can be high performance because you are actually capable of doing event-based processing uh, while being extremely efficient. Um, with the advanced spatial temporal capabilities, you are adding not just compelling performance, but uh, ability to do more interesting work, take out more pre-processing, et cetera. It adds to the capabilities there. Uh, just like event-based processing, it's also event-based communication. So all our nodes or neural processing units communicate only absolutely when necessary, which again helps with um, efficiency as well as uh, targeted communication. We do same things with uh, uh, using memory as and only when needed. So at memory compute. Uh, and then of course, by using the learning aspects uh, that we can provide due to the neuromorphic baseline, we can provide more regular continuous learning at the edge without having to go to retrain at the cloud. All in all, we're reducing the amount of data and certainly amount of raw data, um, which makes it a lot more secure doing this computation at the edge. It would also be useful to understand the difference when we talk about Akita IP, which is kind of event-based neuromorphic versus uh, a traditional deep learning accelerator. We can do the convolution in the event domain, and you'll soon read about how we, or we'll talk about how we do it in the temporal domain as well. Whereas the traditional DLA is doing primarily a convolution operation with matrix multiplication. We, we can fully use, utilize the activation and weight sparsity uh, whereas traditionally you're talking about limited benefit of activations primarily on weight sparsity and that DLAs kind of focus on. Akita was designed from the start to take over the entire network and run it independently, whereas traditional accelerator seems to use the host CPU to run the network, whereas the accelerator accelerates only the math. So thinking about the network as a whole uh, is a, a big step that offloads the system, offloads the host CPU, while making it a lot more efficient to run uh, uh, and schedule on the 
Akita IP as well. Focus on app memory, and we'll touch on that a little bit later, but really it's about how can we use standard memory units to build out a piece of IP versus something that is near memory, let's say in the flash, which is a very different model, or off opposite memory, which is a lot more expensive as well. And finally, um, it is unique in its ability to, to learn. At the moment, it's kind of a one-shot, few-shot learning on the uh, on the device itself. No cloud training necessary, whereas we haven't seen that being offered in the traditional deep learning accelerators at the edge. So this is uh, a rough idea of how we differ, differ from traditional accelerators or what we see on the market. To, to summarize how this would operate, right? So we are looking at the processor and the host CPU doing the data acquisition and the pre-processing, then kicking off the uh, neural processor. The neural processor from that, that point on does the inference, loads all the layers as when needed and indicates the result of the inference back to the CPU or the host CPU when it's done. So the blue line indicates what you would do if the, the host CPU was running uh, with another type of accelerator where it was running actually most of the network um, and, and loading layers doing the in-betweens. Whereas with Akita, you pretty much don't have any load on the system on the CPU, freeing it to do uh, all the rest of the tasks, right? And that's kind of a, an important differentiator that we see being quite attractive in the marketplace. And this also then allows the rest of the system to ease up because the, the memory loading storing, which is an important part or memory management is an important part of literally all of AI compute gets handled in a much more regular manner uh, and can be scheduled accordingly. So how does this actually hit uh, the broader marketplace? So Caveat here, uh, what you're seeing here are some kind of use cases, models, et cetera, that it's not exhaustive, but the categorized by what can be done closer to the sensor edge, um, all the way to what, the, what you can call the compute edge or the network edge. And we've categorized these into effectively some chunks that we see being used across different types of solutions today. It's not that they aren't being done today. So on the left-hand side, things like vibration detection, anomaly detection can be done on the MCU. These are pretty lightweight models, uh, and today's MCUs are more than capable of handling that. Maybe not as efficiently as needed, but it works. There's no problem to solve. If you go to the mid section there, the, the low-res presence detection, gesture recognition, you can do it quite reasonably with an MCU with some level of built-in acceleration. Um, again, there's a lot of computation that goes between the two. Um, again, not as efficient as you need it to be, but effectively works. But as you start adding more th things to be running on that kind of unit, that's when you start seeing the big difference. And of course, on the right, uh, these are advanced sequence prediction, you know, object detection, classification, uh, and some of the transformer network type works that you need a much stronger uh, system. Traditionally now, the high-end A-class processors uh, plus GPU, maybe advanced ML needed to do that. But if it has to scale, those are products that are not as cost-effective, not as power efficient to be able to be taken across uh, a broader set of applications. So with Akita, there are multiple alternatives uh, that we can provide. Right? So at the very edge, um, Akita, doesn't necessarily need a CPU at the very edge if you're doing a limited set of models. But naturally, something like a Cortex-M0 or M3, M23 would expand that capability at the sensor. What we're seeing is uh, sensors want to become more intelligent. They need very simple solutions that can be kept very close to the sensor. right? And this would be a great solution for that. If you get to the kind of the, the middle of here of this is traditionally the MCU market, which can actually scale pretty broadly 
top to bottom. Uh, there you look at something like a Cortex M33, uh, M55, that uh, can be compiled with Akita S, the Akita S being kind of more of a uh, sensor level, the Akita E being the efficiency level. Um, and you can see much more capable MCUs being offered that can handle um, the tasks that we're talking about here, object classification, biometric recognition, um, and doing multiple uh, models at the same time while keeping very much into the power budgets and the cost budgets of, of that particular market. And as we get to the upper end with the Akita P configuration, which is a performance configuration, and let's say something like a Cortex M85, you start seeing um, a lot more capability that can be brought to the cost-effective section of the devices. And you can also see um, you know, things that have been done with general purpose processors being moved towards more of a uh, customized set of solutions, but very high performance requirements done cost effectively so they can scale. Uh, for example, we had um, uh, a particular uh, agricultural company come in with uh, something done uh, alongside one of the higher end edge processors. Um, and you could effectively cost reduce it nearly 10x if you took Akita plus a um, a smaller CPU, well, let's say Cortex M85 or, or, or a, a Cortex uh, A class as well, but not needing all the other peripheralia to kind of go do that. And that's where we start seeing a lot of disruption for compelling performance of the edge, but very effective, uh, cost effective and efficient solutions that can scale. So today's uh, uh, focus really is about what we've done uh, with the Cortex M85, right? Um, and we've kind of demonstrated how Akita could work with the Cortex M85. It's really about finding that real uh, granular upload that works. Cortex M85 is more than capable of handling um, uh, pretty advanced uh, vector com uh, compute computation. It's more than capable of doing a lot of the um, lower granule work on the CPU itself. As the networks get bigger, you want something that is more efficient and targeted for neural processing. That's where Akita comes in. As you can see, the integration piece is quite straightforward. Um, we are effectively a, a fully contained box on the right that does its own DMA to kind of do all the loading storing, has its local scratch pad. It has a series of uh, neural processing nodes um, with their own uh, local memory, optional uh, vision transformer capabilities as well, which can boost vision performance. And that kind of sits conveniently off an AXI bus. It uh, connects with uh, APB and <clears throat> all the traditional system design that you're used to with an ARM Cortex processor. And we kind of use this to demonstrate what can be done but it's a starting point because naturally what we're showing here is a, a simpler network. Um, so for example, we did keyword spotting um, with Akita and Cortex M85. M85 doing the initial setup configuration and then kicking off <clears throat> Akita. Uh, Akita looks for the whole network, brings it in, gets the samples, Create, does the inference, writes the inference output, and M85 takes it from there. Now, if this was a, a more advanced solution where you, actually M85 could do front end of the keyword sampling, let's say is a part of a, a broader vision processing, this would be a really good uh, combination of using uh, the capabilities of the M85 in conjunction with the uh, advanced neural processing capabilities of BrainChip Sakita. And just to kind of take that example forward, right? When we talked about keyword sampling, one of the key benefits of Akita's second generation that we just announced uh, and the temporal neural processing is that we can take in, uh, you know, raw signal and work on it without needing front-end filtering, without needing front-end DSP work to get to it. And raw audio is a very good example, which is why the keyword spotting example is kind of used. 
Traditionally, what you see today is uh, you have the MFCC algorithms with a, a, a CNN attached to it. So there's a lot of signal processing up front, FFT work, filtering, logging, uh, get the coefficients, put them through the CNN, out pops a keyword. Today, the accuracy is about 92%, which is acceptable. And you're doing it with about 320 million max per second. If you consider Akita, you're actually getting rid of that entire red dotted block up there. Um, you're sending the signal either from a, a ADC or a PCM directly into the Akita network and out pops a keyword. The accuracy actually is higher. Um, the total memory needed is lower. And more importantly, the number of computations that you need to do to get there is substantially lower. And they're not created equal for most part because when you look at DSPs, especially size, et cetera, included, those computations can be more expensive than what you would do on a digital network. And we kind of demonstrated it. I will tell you, this is not the most optimal um, implementation we have, but with that, you could do it at under two microjoules per inference in a 28 nanometer implementation. And this is just a start. Effectively, there's a lot more optimization that can be done because uh, this was an over uh, kind of a, uh, specced Akita going there. We could actually squeeze it down and you could see a, a much bigger benefit coming from that as well. Now let's take up the performance level. Um, video object detection at the edge untethered from the cloud is not um, been shown to scale yet. You still have edge boxes, which are often with a fan that do things with like with the camera feeding in. Uh, what we demonstrate here is video object de detection on a, a Kitty 2D data set, right? The traditional SIM CLR uh, network with the ResNet 50 backbone has a mean uh, uh, average precision of about 57%. Right. It takes 26 million parameters to go there and about 82 million or billion max per second to execute. And that's kind of the benchmark we're comparing against today for production. With Akita, uh, it's about 57%, uh, which is the same accuracy for our uh, same precision. You're 50 times fewer parameters and five times fewer operations. So Effectively, Akita could support both because it can support ResNet 50 natively in hardware. Uh, it can support our new kind of uh, spatial temporal uh, neural net capabilities, which is what TNN shows. And effectively, you could do very high end, effectively HD quality video object addition at 30 frames per second in under 75 milliwatts in 16 nanometer. This really changes the, the way you actually get some of these things to market. Cameras are no longer just recording, they're recognizing, right? So you're going from just uh, uh, effectively into truly perception and towards cognition with this kind of work that you can do on the, on the edge. And one of the key things that Akita has and our technology has been doing is to be completely sensor agnostic. So we showed how you could take audio in. Um, we can show how video is done. And you probably have seen demos on our video channel that show uh, s smell, taste, uh, et cetera, being demonstrated with the same processor with kind of the same set of networks. So you have the traditional human senses, but now you have chemical detection, uh, vibration detection, all kinds of sensors that can plug in into the same network, into the same IP, and get all the optimal output you get. So it's optimal for any sensor. It is fully self-managed, so the network can be managed on its own. It maximizes the power efficiency for it and simplifies the development of how you actually get some of these sensor-based intelligent solutions to market. So getting things to market, let's see how we start, right? Um, we have various development platforms uh, that we support today, uh, and they're kind of categorized in, in the way people use them. So 
with edge impulse, um, usually they're pulling in uh, customers or developers who may not be super users, uh, have AI expertise, but may not be to the, the absolute level. So Edge Impulse is a development environment that helps them get there. And we work very closely with them to make sure that Akita as the IP, our compile, um, compiler tooling is integrated into it to give a very seamless experience. For the experts, um, we have the Meta TF or Meta TensorFlow uh, tooling that plugs into the TensorFlow uh, Keras uh, framework. We're actually announcing uh, our PyTorch uh, support second half of the year. And so the super users can actually use this in a, again, seamless way to their framework of choice uh, to build out, optimize, tune their models. And then we're working closely with a number of players in the ecosystem, such as Enviso or Emotion 3D, where uh, the customers are really looking for a, a, an application that's already done. Right? So we have all the three vectors to help support um, development and ease of deployment based on Akita. Now, all three ways you get to the Akita model library, right? And so you create the model that solves that problem. Um, no AI solution is useful without a full runtime capability. And the Akita runtime is particularly intelligent to actually support not just the fact that it can run these models in time. There's a, a reasonable amount of intelligence built into it where if you effect, effectively change the number of nodes you want to use, let's say, it can automatically understand reschedule to make it as optimal while uh, not needing you to go through the entire compile process all over again. So there is a intelligence built in to make it much more scalable and deployable at the edge, also customizable at the edge. So how do you get from concept to production? There's an evaluation phase that you can do with uh, TensorFlow Keras, for example, with MetaTF. We have a model zoo for uh, developers to start playing with. And again, we work closely with companies like Edge Impulse who have a development environment that already has uh, the, the sandboxes necessary, the tooling necessary for development. We also provide uh, various types of boards or boxes to build out prototype systems and, and tune that model further. What we've seen, especially in the smaller uh, companies trying to prototype it, once they've done that, they want to build small volume prototypes or actually small volume production where uh, we do have uh, chips that we sell to kind of enable that, that's AKD 1000, but they're primarily to seed the market and grow it along with the tools that already exist with MetaTF and Edge Impulse. And then of course, um, when you truly want to scale, you integrate it into your SOC with the Akita IP, right? So there is a, uh, a natural process from concept to taking it to high volume production through the various phases in between. For the ARM folks, we are CMSIS ready, right? Um, it has, uh, in fact, one of the, the key benefits is with CMSIS, we, there is a, a natural balancing on what can be done on the, uh, on the network versus what, what gets done on the Cortex-M. And, and that balance will constantly shift based on what needs to be done. So we make sure that we are ready for it. By definition, all our tooling runtimes are uh, CPU and OS agnostic. Um, but they're also supported by all the key tools that are done with like ARM GCC, uh, ARM CC and GCC. We have done the testing with Kyle um, and you can see where, what you need to uh, based on the link you see here. Let's what actually then move to something that shows what we're doing and it's not just slideware, right? So um, on the left-hand side, what you see is, uh, the faster objects, more objects model that came uh, from Edge Impulse. Uh, this was actually very seamlessly uh, integrated uh, through our flow onto Akita. And what it's demonstrating is the ability very efficiently 
to identify skittles. Obviously, it's a very important task, as you know, identifying skittles versus uh, a bolt or a Hershey's bar. But that's what this demonstrates. On the right hand side, actually, we're showing an even more interesting application. Certainly, both can be very applicable in the industrial environment. But what the right hand side showing is uh, a, a DDS camera, an event based camera, basically from Prophecy um, that identifies kind of changing objects. And this is now the benefits of effectively neuromorphic sensing and neuromorphic processing. So you're taking out all the unnecessary parts and focusing only on the actions that matter from, from the point the camera senses all the way to actually the inference that's needed. So this is actually a very interesting solution for uh, uh, inventory management uh, and in fact fault detection even in uh, industrial sections. All right, so that kind of wraps up what we had. Um, the simple takeaways from this are that Cortex M85, I say, because we demonstrated this, but it is actually independent of a particular processor. So any Cortex, whether it's ARM, would work pretty well. Uh, and we could combine that with Akita to provide pretty compelling, disruptive edge IoT solutions that do pretty much all the inferencing and the baseline learning on the device rather than have to connect to cloud. What we didn't focus on too much is that we can actually do today's complex models um, already, almost entirely in the neural processing hardware without needing much intervention from CPU if needed. And we're future-proof for new ones. We can do secure learning and intelligent customization on device without need for cloud retraining. And this actually helps with personalizing uh, security and privacy management that is becoming quite in, important to not just individuals, but to uh, corporations. And we've focused on making it easy to deploy and we're growing the ecosystem. So um, we're actually very happy for you to ask us more, get to the next level of depth, and uh, you'll have the connections here to get there. So with that, I think we'll open up to questions. And I might invite uh, my colleagues, Rob Telson, who's the VP of Ecosystem, and Todd Vera, who's the Director of Customer Solutions, to join us. Let's get their cameras on and mics on. And I think, Nandan, if you want to stop sharing your screen, I will get it set up so that everyone can see. Um, everyone can see the panel we have with us. Sorry about that. No worries. Let's get while them while you're just sorting out your screen. I have a couple of questions while the um, we've got a few coming in for the audience, so we'll have plenty of time for Q and A. Um, would love to hear a bit more about um, with the uh, with what you presented today. Um, what ARM IP, what ARM processes does it work with? You know, I think you mentioned M eighty five a bit, but um, and I think you kind of hinted that it works at a bit more than that. But would love to hear a bit more as to you know what other ARM IP does it work with? So. Um... The good thing about what we're doing is it's actually processor agnostic or it's agnostic, right? So literally any ARM processor uh, would work with an Akita. We actually will sit off the AXI bus. And so we could be integrated into any ARM Cortex system. So I think that's a quick and simple answer. That's what we like to hear. You know, it's very flexible, I think, is what we can say. Anyone can choose whatever on IP you want to. And then, I mean, finally, just thinking about it, what kind of applications are you sort of seeing this being used for? So we, we're seeing a pretty broad set, right? So I'll, I'll give you two uh, very interesting ones. So NASA actually uh, to, are taking it to space to demonstrate the ability to do intelligence without connection to cloud, surprisingly. Uh, it's well above the cloud at that point. Um, the the other one was Mercedes, for example, showing in cabin use and, and and talking about how neuromorphic solutions based on this would be five to ten times better than anything that they've seen, right? And so they announced that about a couple of years ago. But if you spread it out, you can see this in in fact a lot of healthcare type devices are looking interesting for because today they need a lot of 
uh, each signal that you get for a vital science prediction for healthcare um, can be very complex and needs a lot of pre-processing. By seeing something that can effectively do this without needing that pre-processing, without needing that DSP, suddenly you get much more compelling uh, embeddable or wearable health devices that you couldn't do before, right? And the, the, the privacy, the customization aspect, which is important because no person is exactly the same. So it needs to learn your normal, not, not the statistical normal, which is a, another important piece of it. So things like hearable devices, wearable devices, healthcare devices, embeddable devices, are suddenly looking at this technology as, oh, wow, we can change how that, uh, you know, both the scalability aspect, the cost aspect of it, and the battery aspect, because you can do this in energy harvesting type situations. Industrial has a clear set of requirements there because they are using it as a concentrated box versus at device or at, um, at machine. They need real-time uh, predictive maintenance. That's where this becomes really interesting. Automotive, clearly, you have so many sensors coming in and so much uh, noise in the system that you want to minimize that. So in cabins one, but Li LIDAR, radar, all need uh, intelligent real-time um, processing rather than uh, all going to one central giant box. Um, and then, of course, you see um, agriculture, you see um, other consumer devices, smart homes. So we're seeing a lot of pull in all these sectors, but I would say uh, cameras and video object detection, which everybody wants, are getting more interesting with this. And those get are actually so diverse that could be used in industrial, could be used in automotive, could be used in um, all, all other security surveillance, et cetera. I hope I answered that question. That was a pretty broad answer, though. <laughs> well, as you say, it can be used for many different things, and certainly those those use cases, I'm sure, will be uh, will, will will strike a call with a lot of people on this on this call and thinking how they could use it. So, um, no, thank you for that. As you say, it's nice to have a, that breadth of the offering that this can work with. Um, so, let's jump to some of the questions that are flying in on the Zoom Q and A box. One of them, I'm going to pick the top one here that's um, that's come in. How much is your hardware used for edge inference and how much does it enable forms of edge training or distributed learning, federated swarm, et cetera? And is the whole model all loaded on device or loaded layer by layer? And they also asked about pruning, quantization, and sparsity. Sure, let me let me take this one, Nandan. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, sure. So, you know, we do use it for edge inference and our edge learning is for what we call device personalization. So if I have a classification model, um, if you saw the demo that was doing nuts and bolts, and I want to add um, washers or a screwdriver or whatever, I can do that edge learning by reclassifying on the edge on hardware. So I don't have to go back and retrain it. That's a nice little example. Um, and then the other question was, how much of the layers are ran on the hardware? Do I lay, do it layer by layer or do I bring the whole network in? That, Really, we want to bring as much of the layers as we can as possible, depending on the configuration you have and the memory optimizations you have. So we'll try and run the whole network without the CPU in intervention. Once a CPU loads the network or tells the uh, DMA to bring that network in, the DMA handles all the layers without any CPU intervention. So let me add to that, right? So I think... That, that's important, right? So especially in an embedded context, you could have the entire model, et cetera, loaded in cache rather than needing intermediate, intermediate memory. So DMAs can do a, a pretty good job of doing it so that it fits on device as needed and, and handling the layers accordingly. The second thing you asked about, um, can it do federated learning, et cetera? It's not out of question, right? So we've talked about personalization as one thing, but if you think about industry um, production lines, if you learn something and tune something to it, and you have three other uh, locations that do it, it is possible to actually do federated learning when you kind of merge that in, but that would be a layer above. We haven't yet done anything to kind of assist that, but you could build on top of it. 
Brilliant. Thank you both for that. That's a really, really comprehensive answer. Um, and a question has also come in around, are there any boards you'd suggest trying to, with featuring this IP, that you could uh, recommend to deploy their models on, so actually getting their hands on this? Is there anything you could talk about with that? Um, so currently, none of the, the, the licensed customers that we have have launched their boards yet. However, we do have uh, boards that are available um, and, and boxes that are available, in fact, we can provide the the links for those that are needed uh, that need to get access to them. That'd be great. Yeah, if you want to uh, add those in the chat for sure, um, and then I can repost them uh, if anyone's interested. Let's have a look at some of the others. They are flying in. Um, let's talk a bit. Also, I think someone's asked about the commercial side of it around your kind of um go to market model uh and if you're able to share any more of that and how they can actually engage with you which is uh, always interesting um so if we want to quickly tackle that one if that's all right sure so our primary um go to market model is ip right um we do provide boards um but and silicon but again it's limited it's really about getting a design off ground prototyping done maybe small volume while you then build it into uh, the IP into uh, maybe your SOC solution. But we're also working with partners like Renesas, for example, Megachips, and they will bring their standard products to market with certain configurations of Akita built in. So it really depends on what, what you want. If you want to build a customized solution, then yes, IP is the, the way to do it. If you want to prototype it, we have silicon for you. Uh, and then in the, in the short course of time after that, if you are not trying to build it into your own integrated designs and just broad, broadening, you'll see offerings from other customers, especially in the MCU world. Brilliant. Thank you, Nandan, on that. And um, I think as and people are upvoting questions, so I'm going to pick those first. So if you want your question to be featured or you like the look of another question that's been asked, then do hit the thumbs up button in the Q&A box and I'll get to those first. Uh, we've, you know, I thought when I wonder when Chat GPT was going to come up. I wonder if Chat GPT wrote this wrote this question. Uh, could Akida compute a large model like Chat GPT, for example, on a smartphone, and how long would the battery last? Okay, uh, they're called LLMs for a reason. <laughs> they are pretty large <laughs> language models. Uh, so. One, one philosoph philosophical thing I'll say is that part of what we're doing, if we have to do that at the edge, is take a, a holistic view of how you make things more efficient. And that includes how can we make the model efficient? How can we actually reduce the system load, so on and so forth? I know there's a slightly long drawn out answer, but part of what we're also working on um, with our temporal event based neural nets, for example, is the ability to make models that can fit much more to the edge side while meeting or beating the accuracy of the higher end models. So today, I don't expect ChatGPT to be running on a smartphone. Um, at least I may be wrong. Uh, the technology, the architecture of Akita doesn't prevent it from being that way, but it, it need much larger uh, scaled implementation or many such to actually make that happen. But we'll have to kind of uh, do some titration of are there models that are similar? How, how, how can we actually condense those models to be able to do that in an edge context? And, and just to re reiterate on that, we do have a research team that works on models um, that is going through those types of use cases and trying to get something small and condensed that works similar, but is highly more efficient. Thank you both. Thank you for that. As you, as I said, you know, chat GPT, I thought would come up at some point. So uh, good answers all around. And how many neurons with four bit weights could a key to P emulate with on chip weights? This is from Frederick, who wants to take that one. So let, Todd, you want to try that? Because I, I can't think of the top of my head. Yeah, I don't really go down to the neurons, but what we do when we do the uh, edge-based learning, what we do is do the shifting of the weight. So I can add several new classes and enough neurons to handle it um, for a handful of new uh, classifications. But maybe 
Um, Frederick, um, we can take this offline and connect with our research team to get to the level of depth it looks like you need, right? Yeah. We obviously haven't provided to the level you have, but we'd be happy to take that question and go deeper with you. Definitely. I might learn something. No, thank you. <laughs> it's always good. It's always good. And uh, a question, top race question at the moment. SNN has been known to be difficult. Well, SNNs have been known to be difficult to train. How have you solved that problem? So this is one thing I realized after uh, going through our presentation, we hadn't made very clear, right? So we are event-based. Uh, we are SNN-like, right? But one of the biggest changes we made when we tried to take it to market was to make that convolution built into it so we can actually take today's models, right? And run them on Akita. Okay, so uh, in, in fact, the meta TF flow has uh, um, a CNN to SNN uh, portion of it. And that's actually, you're right. That's where a lot of that magic lies on how do you make that efficient uh, and how do you map today's models onto that. So the good news is for you, if you have models that you like today, those can be run on Akita once they go through the flow and they can be optimized in your favorite TensorFlow uh, approach. Uh, a lot of what we do is if, we, if native SNNs come, it will be even more efficient at that point because you'll be designing with an SNN in mind as opposed to taking a CNN mapping. Having said that, CNN to SNN, I mean, a lot of what we show in terms of benefits versus um, effectively what's out there today uh, is on today's models, right? And so we're trying to show, demonstrate the benefits even on today's models being 5, 10, 20x better. Um, and in a couple of cases, actually 100x better using um, Akita. Yeah, let me add on to that. The nice thing about uh, the CNN to SNN flow, we are actually using the feature extractions from traditional models. So you can actually get the benefits of your CNN implementation and then get the efficiency of an event-based uh, convolution. Awesome. Thank you both. That's really great. And we've got five minutes left and we've still got 11 questions. So I'm definitely going to make sure we follow up with as many of these as we can afterwards. Um, and we'll work with the Brainship team to follow up with the ones that we can um, offline, if that's all right with you guys. Because um, in fact, it's gone up to 12 already. People are clamoring to get their questions in when I say five minutes to go over everyone's like quickly. Um, so could you explain a bit more about TENN? What existing networks can it replace? How it could it circumvent, circumvent FFTs and what are its limitations with respect to the applications? Great, so uh, in fact, we can probably um, point you to our website where it's a level one of that discussion already there. We're actually putting out um, a paper shortly on that as well. So uh, if you wanna uh, send us your contact, we can provide that or use this channel as well. So TNN or temporal based neural nets, right? Um, uh, is a modeling strategy that we've kind of used that uh, reduces the amount of data to get to the same, same level of accuracy. And it is pretty versatile. So the same TNN type model that we've used to demonstrate video object detection from frame-based cameras, right? And getting two, three orders of magnitude better in terms of both parameters and operations. We've shown that with event-based cameras. We've shown that with uh, vital signs prediction. We've shown it with audio. And so, in fact, those are the only ones we've tried so far, but we, we actually see that being applicable into even broader models. So. Uh, effectively, you know, you look at a unicorn or uh, an LSTM model, GRU models, uh, the TNN is has the temporal aspects. It trains like a CNN, but is much more efficient in terms of data usage, right? So it can do 3D uh, time series, do 1D time series. So a lot of models that you see can be easily replaced by the TNN. And again, as I said, it's versatile, so it can be reused in, in different contexts. Awesome, thank you. And one final addition to that, uh, if you want to add anything else, a similar question on TNN was, is it possible to use TNN to reduce the noise of an audio stream? Actually, Todd is probably chomping at the bit. Uh, in fact, 
we see very interesting uses of that, right? So denoising is absolutely a very useful uh, outcome of using TNN. And you combine that with our ability to actually do learning. Now you can actually do contextual denoising, right? Hey, I can denoise a pub environment. I can denoise a garage environment. I can denoise a classroom environment and actually learn those kind of profiles as you go along. So yes, I think denoising would be a very, very interesting use case um, for TNN. Yeah, and we are currently working on these denoising applications that are state-of-the-art, um, basically separating the noise from the audio that you're trying to get, and then you can bring them back together, or you know, some people want to bring them back together and do some upscaling. Some people just want to reduce them all together and get rid of all those noise or, you know, for better speech enhancement. I, I would also say just to kind of finish that off and actually in those types of environments, especially time series data aspects of that, you, you see orders, I mean, then two, three orders of magnitude benefit uh, because, and not even counting the front end work that you're getting rid of, the bomb cost that you're getting rid of up front. Awesome. Thank you so much, both. And we are at time. So I'm afraid we're going to have to leave the rest of the questions and we'll take those offline, if that's okay with the folks who are. So sorry we didn't have time to get to those, but there were just so many today. That's always great to see. I'd much rather have that than uh, no questions at all. Um, so thank you guys so much, Nandan, Todd, Rob, for a great presentation today. Is there any final thing you want to add before we wrap up? I'll start with yourself, Nandan. So I would say thanks, Tobias. I mean, it's been great working with you try, trying to get this together. Obviously, ARM's always been great at uh, fostering an ecosystem that works, and we're happy to kind of work with it. We look forward to more of these. Uh, and the last thing I'd say to everybody who listened, thank you for the time and thank you for the engagement. And uh, please, you, you should have those uh, links on file. Please contact us. We'd love to continue that. We have newsletters that you could sign up for. We have YouTube channels you can follow up with. Um, we, we, we love the input and we kind of uh, appreciate anything you can give us. Absolutely. Todd, Rob, Todd, I'll start quickly for anything on your side, anything else? Yeah, if you had a question that didn't get answered, just please send it over to sales at brainchip.com and we'll you know get a hold of you afterwards and we can further discussion. Brilliant, and Rob? Yeah, thanks for all the attendees. We really appreciate you joining us today. And again, just echoing what Nandan and, and Todd said, um, contact us at sales at brainchip.com. We'll address all your questions and we can go from there. And we truly appreciate this, this relationship that we're building with ARM and continuing to build on the, the technologies and how they work very well together. So thank you. No, thank you guys so much for a great presentation. Audience, thank you so much for some great, great questions. We'll see you next week for a presentation from Newton talking about the next generation smart toothbrush, uh, which is, uh, we love those kind of topics. Uh, so very different uh, each week. So if you like the sound of hearing from the latest trends, technologies and best practices, then Arm Tech Talks is the, uh, is the place to be. So make sure you sign up for that at arm.com slash tech talks. We'll see you at the same time next week on Tech Talk, tech talk Tuesday.